Okay, so we're going to have a panel who's going to discuss some of the ethical implications of genome research and genetics research. And let me introduce them first. Um, First, uh, Dr. Greg Eastwood, and many of you probably know this, is Dr. Eastwood is, is a graduate of this medical school as, as well. He's currently the director of the Inamori Center for Ethics and Excellence at Case Western Reserve University. Um, he, after graduating from here, he did his training in internal medicine and gastroenterology at the University of Pennsylvania and Boston University. He was in the faculty at Harvard Medical School. Um, and was the dean of the Medical College of Georgia and for 13 years was the president of SUNY uh, Syracuse Medical University. And really, how I got to know him is, is he was really stepped to the fore. He was the interim president at our university during a troubled time. It's be, and actually, as I've gotten to know Dr. Eastwood, it's really been a remarkable pleasure. Um, he was a wonderful president. <laughs> and um, I, I personally want to thank him for that. Um, and then uh, Patty Marshall is a professor in the Department of Bioethics. Patty Marshall is also a good friend of mine. Patty Marshall's been involved in a lot of social issues, informed, I informed issues related particularly to research being done in developing countries. Uh, she's been on national panels concerned with the informed consent process, and she's actually been on the HATMAP panels, I think, in Nigeria and Kenya, if I'm not mistaken. Okay. I'm, this is what I'm getting off your CV, I think. Okay. And then finally, Eric Youngs, who's also a professor in the Department of Bioethics. Eric, Eric's a really fan. I've been on a lot of committees with Eric, and it's a pleasure to work with him. He has his PhD from the Department of Philosophy, but he's, he's done a lot of work on the kind of social and philosophical implications of modern genetics research. And just like Patty, he's been on the National uh, Human Genome Research Institute ethics panels, social policy panels, and they're really kind of giant figures in our country and worldwide in terms of the implications of genetics research. So with that, I'll stop. Thank you. The Senate second act, though, occurred in a room very similar to this one. It's over in an, what I call a new section of the medical school. It's probably about 30 years old. <laughs> and it was in October 1996, 11 years ago this month. And it's in an uh, auditorium that's dedicated to Dr. Coy. And we were all assembled there, including Dr. Coy. He was sitting in a wheelchair right down there in the front of the aisle. And it was, uh, I was there uh, to give what they labeled as a uh, keynote address. And I addressed the influence of the Western Reserve curriculum that started, I believe, in uh, 1952. Uh, uh, on uh, you on uh, not only U.S. medical education but world uh, education of, med of student, medical students, and so I went on for about a half hour. Is it still working? Okay, um, talking about all the, the you know Dr. Wern, Dr. Wiggins, other people, Dr. Coy, T. Halham, and so on, and of course I emphasized uh, appropriately Dr. Coy's role in the development of that uh, curriculum. Actually, by the way, when I looked at the, some of the uh, published literature on this, because these people were publishing in the medical literature in the late 40s and uh, early 50s about this, uh, it was somewhat gratifying to me to learn uh, how much difficulty <laughs> they had with the department chairs. Things had not changed uh, you know, in my various roles as dean and president of one thing or another. Uh, I had similar difficulties. So at the end of this, uh, someone said to uh, Dr. Coy, well, what do you think about this? And in typical coy fashion, he said, it was great what we did, but you know, that was 50 years ago or 40 years ago. We need to look at the curriculum now, and we need to do something about it now. Now, of course, was 1996. And that's what this medical school did uh, a few years ago. And some of you may have the opportunity to uh, talk to medical students in the so-called Western Reserve II uh, curriculum. Uh, my role in this um, uh, panel is something like Socrates. I'm going to ask lots of questions, probably not answer very many of them. Uh, the questions I'm going to ask uh, are actually on page 47 of your uh, syllabus material, and I'm going to go through them now, uh, and um, we'll, uh, we'll uh, uh, my colleagues will uh, help address them. But let me t say right at the outset, I have some extra copies too if anyone wants to uh, uh, 
Okay. Here, why don't we just have those are individual. Um, uh, I'd like you to now be thinking of questions that come to your mind, and not only questions, but comments. One of the benefits of a panel like this is to sort of expand the, uh, the, the amount of understanding and medical knowledge, and I think in this room there probably <coughs> are uh, people who understand these issues uh, as well as uh, panelists, and certainly as well as I do. Uh, what do we mean by the third world? Uh, what is the first world and the second world? Uh, in my view, the boundaries are indistinct and they're changing, and uh, uh, Professor Marshall is actually going to talk a little bit about, about that in a few minutes. Another question is, uh, conducting clinical trials and other human research is highly regulated in the United States and other so-called developed countries and, and can be easier in the third world uh, easier because of fewer regulations. What are the ethical issues here? Third, uh, business is conducted differently in different countries, sometimes involving payoffs to officials to get things done. How should we deal with this? Uh, fourth, the ability to understand research probably varies a great deal among potential research participants in third world countries. How do we assure that people really understand of course, this occurs in the good old USA, too. I mean, this is an ongoing issue of making sure people really understand what they sign those consent and assent forms that Dr. Krause mentioned. Uh, I'm a real fan of John Le Carre. I've read everything he's written uh, at, least, at least twice. <laughs> and um, in his book, uh, The Constant Gardener, and uh, there was a movie I, I believe <coughs> made of that, too, Big Pharma exploits people in Africa and disregards adverse, sometimes deadly side effects of a new drug in order to shade the data in favor of the drug's effectiveness. How much of this actually occurs? Uh, even if it does not occur as depicted in the book, is it justified to use people who otherwise may not have access to drugs or medical care for research purposes? The sixth question here, people who participate as subjects in clinical research in developing countries are likely to get better health care. Sometimes that occurs in the United States too when they're in the, in the study. For the duration of the study, better than those who do not participate. What are the eth ethical issues of providing different health care within the same family or the same neighborhood? And the next question is related. When, when the research study is over, then what? Do the researchers pack up and leave? And I think Patty Marshall, again, has had some experience with this. Do we have any ongoing responsibility to the people who participated regarding their health care? And finally, genetic studies of people in other countries often produce results that are generalized to whole communities, populations, ethnic groups. And those affiliations are often more important to individual decision making than they are in the U.S. Uh, in designing these studies, do researchers owe the groups involved? Uh, for, uh, forms of respect like those we offer individual participants here uh, and so on. So um, these are questions that came to our minds as panelists and uh, you uh, may have similar questions or uh, uh, new questions may occur to you. So I'm going to now ask uh, Patty Marshall to comment on this whole concept of third world. Uh, is it a pejorative term, an accurate term? Go ahead, Patty. Thank you very much. Can you hear me? <clears throat> I'm sorry, I'm, I have a, a little bit of a cold right now. No, no. What I'd like to do right now, very briefly, is unpack some of the language that we use to represent or to signify different populations throughout the world. So, in recent decades, you've heard terms such as the developed world versus the developing world, the first, second, and third world, resource rich, resource poor, um, uh, low income settings, and, and uh, all of us who have worked in different, with different populations throughout the world are somewhat uncomfortable with, um, with uh, tagging communities or entire countries. Oh, thanks a million. Well, <laughs> I, I need a lot. <laughs> Would you all like yeah, some I water? Yeah, 
Yeah. Pass them down. Okay. I have a cough drop here too, in case you need it. Okay. Okay. Um, and so what what I want to do is um, is uh, back away from uh, this sort of polarized representation and and even um, even a continuum where on one hand you have uh, you use a term like developing versus developed and that that implies a kind of continuum about economic development and so on what I'd like to do is step back from that and make it a little bit more complex and a little bit more um, grounded in the reality of our experience by uh, suggesting that we th that we think in terms of um, uh, if you could imagine a double axis so that one axis represents um, an uh, uh, economic development or technological development um, more or less along a continuum but then cut across that is um, a an axis that represents a completely different set of, um, of uh, you know, subject matter, and that is um, cultural orientation. So that you have on one hand an axis that represents economic development, <clears throat> I'm sorry, and then on the other hand, you have an axis that represents an cultural orientation, and you might think of this um, as being a Western orientation on one end and a non-Western orientation on the other end. So can, it, am I making this double access? It, it's a fairly simple idea, but, but, uh, it's, but it complicates how we um, orient ourselves to the world, how as researchers we think about the work that we're doing with individuals and communities. There's an overlay, <clears throat> there's an overlay on this double axis of cultural orientation and economic development, and that is health and science infrastructure. So if you're looking through a lens and you shift it, you turn the lens, you can bring into focus um, a, a, a much more uh, varied um, uh, uh, picture of um, the world globally so that you can think about, even here in the United States, we have uh, communities, we have populations who live in communities that are um, very, they're resource poor. You might be working with a community that has um, very much a non-Western orientation. You can imagine a place like Japan, and here I'm speaking in very global terms. Um, you could imagine a place like Japan, which has a non-Western cultural orientation, but is exceptionally industrial, is very industrialized, very developed. Um, I want to, uh, I, I want to problematize a bit what happens when you begin, when you um, think about communities and populations in uh, stereotypical sorts of ways. And I'll use the example of informed consent to bring this into focus. Um, I, in my own, I'm a medical anthropologist by training, but I've lived in the world, uh, I, I live in a um, uh, multidisciplinary world, so I've worked in the area of bioethics now for, oh my gosh, uh, <laughs> 20 years, is that true? Um, so um, I'm very seriously concerned about research ethics right now, in particular international research ethics. Um, for a number of years, I've been looking at informed consent to genetic epidemiological research that's taking place in the U.S. and in Nigeria. Also, um, as uh, Jim mentioned, I've been, um, uh, I'm a co-investigator for the African sites for the um, International HapMap project. And so I've worked directly with the uh, teams, with the Yoruba, uh, community 
um, in doing community consultation, community engagement um, with the Aba Alamu community um, in, uh, as they began to prepare for the collection of DNA samples. Um, so let me, let me br uh, bring some of the complexity about how we signify and represent populations and communities focusing on informed consent. Dr. Krauss, I loved your, um, I loved the, the, um, the slides that you showed uh, where you had the picture of the consent document and the picture of the child assenting and the, the getting consent from the woman. Um, very often it's easy to, it's too easy to characterize um, populations in a place like uh, Nigeria where I work as being um, more non-literate, um, uh, less sophisticated about uh, genetic research, any uh, scientific research. Well, we were looking at two populations in um, working with two populations in Nigeria, one in the city of Ibadan, um, where many of the people who donated samples for the HapMap project uh, live. And we worked with another population in a small town of Igbora, um, more rural. And uh, one of the questions that we asked as we uh, did the interview people about the consent process was did you need to get permission from anyone to your, and specifically your spouse to participate in this genetic research? In the rural population, about 50% of the women who participated in this study, the genetic study, said that they did have to get permission. And that compares to about 20% in the urban area, the women who, who were married. So you can see there's intracultural um, variation in how uh, these individuals um, think about and practice uh, the negotiation of consent, um, the negotiation of the consent process. In other words, getting permission from your husband is not a normative behavior. Um, the, uh, well, maybe I should stop there because we're going to have a conversation, right? Right. <laughs> right, okay. <laughs> Although you were just on the verge of telling us the anecdote, right? The, About the uh, women in your study. Um, I'll cook him a good meal. Oh, okay. Yeah, this is worth it. Okay, so um, I, 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 use, I like to use a number of different methodological approaches in the work that I do, so I combine um, quantitative and qualitative uh, methods. And we have a cohort in that informed consent project that I'm working on of close to 900 people. So we did um, uh, extensive interviews uh, following the consent process about their understanding of the consent form, motivations to participate, and so on. Um, I, we took 10% of the people that we interviewed and did uh, audio taped in-depth interviews with them. It, one of the interviews uh, took place in, um, that took place in uh, the city of Ibadan. Um, we were talking to a woman about what would happen if she asked her husband if she could participate, and he said, no, you cannot participate. What would, I said, what would you do? And she said, uh, well, I would wait a while and then talk with him again a little bit later. And I said, OK. So he's still saying, no, you cannot participate. And she thought for a minute, and she said, Mm-hmm. I will fix him a delicious meal. <laughs> Good pounded yam, egusi, you know. And then I said, he's still saying no. 
I do not want you to participate in this. And she said, I'm going to talk to his mother. <laughs> and um, and I, I love this story because um, well, informed consent is one of my areas of expertise. And, and frankly, the, I have issues with the, the, this idea of consent because um, fundamentally, I believe <coughs> that most people volunteer for a project based on the trust that they have in the person who is asking them or based on the trust that they have in the institution that the people are representing or based on their past experience with the medical institution, the science, um, what's involved in a particular project. That's a separate issue. But I like this anecdote because it calls attention directly to the to how decisions are in fact negotiated in real life. If you think about this legalistic notion of informed consent, um, we make a lot of assumptions. We assume that people have, we assume that people understand what is being communicated to them. Um, Jim, you did such a fabulous job talking about the HAP map. I am not a, uh, I do not have a genetics background. And in all of the discussions at NIH with the, um, with the uh, teams that were involved, each time that I would hear a lecture about the HAP map, I learned more. And can you imagine going into a community and speaking with people who do not have a scientific background um, about something as complicated about the development of a haplotype map for the human genome? Yeah, this is, this is complicated stuff. Um, so I, I believe strongly in the issue of trust in reference to informed consent. I believe strongly in the informed consent process and oversight for that process. So I know I've talked to some people who say, why are we doing this at all? I'm talking too much. I'm sorry, you all. OK, <laughs> I'm going to stop right now. <laughs> Wait, I want to say one more thing. Wait, just one more thing, because I really want us to, to uh, address this issue of, um, and it's one that, um, that, in fact, both of you raised in, in, in your um, presentations, and that is, what is our obligation, when we do research, what is our obligation to, um, to build science and health capacity throughout the world what is our obligation through the work that we do to contribute to the amelioration of health disparities globally? What is our obligation to reducing the disease burden in populations throughout the world? To me, those are so crucial. You should have just asked me to stop. Put in a quarter and I'll start talking <laughs> about this stuff because I love it so much. Uh, Eric is going to uh, give us the uh, context for this uh, discussion. You know, why should we be concerned or interested in ethical issues? And then uh, I think what I'm going to do is um, ask, uh, I guess uh, it's, it's way, the way it's starting out is I'm sort of acting as the moderator, although I do have some uh, opinions about this. I'm going to ask uh, each uh, uh, Patty and then Eric after Eric's done. Um, to give an example out of their own experience of an ethical issue and how it was addressed. And then I think I want to hear from you. We want to hear from you, not just your questions, but how you would address some, some of these issues. So, Eric? Thanks. Uh, I don't uh, need to take too much time because in some ways the context has already been nicely uh, set up for us by yeah. Dr. Krause and, yeah. and Jim. Um, but just a few uh, introductory comments so that you get the sense of, of who I am, for example. Um, my training is in philosophy, and when I took my first job in a medical school, my dad said, aha, following in my footsteps, I see, because he 
was a Presbyterian missionary to Congo, and that's where I grew up in, in Congo. And he said, all you're doing is a secular form of missionary work going to spread ethics to the uh, medical community. And I said, no, Dad, you don't understand. I'm learning as much ethics from my natives as, uh, as I'm teaching. And he said, and you think it was any different in Congo? Uh, he was learning as much from the people he worked with as he was teaching. And well, that was an interesting insight for me that continues to come back now that we've um, begun the internationalization of the kinds of research projects that we work on and the, and the ethics that come up. We have as, as much to learn from our colleagues around the world as we have to teach. But why, how did we get here? Because it seems to me that in the era of Rammelkamp's work, um, the biomedical research establishment was working pretty much in this trust mode that Patty was talking about with a lot, without a lot of uh, overlay of regulation and formalized uh, procedures. Something happened between that time and the era in which Jim works uh, around the world. Uh, as Dr. Krause suggested, there are multiple layers of uh, formalities to go through these days. Sometimes they seem a little silly out in the field. But um, what lies behind that? Well, I think in some ways this concern for research ethics is America's gift to the world because in the interim between the World War II and 1975, um, we discovered breaches of that trust in the uh, American community, situations in which it seemed like vulnerable groups of people were being exploited as research subjects. Um, you will recall the public health service study of the natural history of syphilis in Tuskegee, Alabama, probably the most famous case, but also a study of uh, hepatitis in a captive population of mentally retarded children in the Willowbrook Institution. Um, these stories, others like them, uh, came out in the late 60s and early 70s and galvanized our policymakers into thinking maybe it's not enough, unfortunately, to rely on the trust. Uh, maybe we need to build some rules to uh, underline a couple of important convictions. Uh, one was, of course, that participating in clinical research and medical research ought to be voluntary. You ought to uh, be willing to come forward as a uh, volunteer and do it with, uh, on the basis of your own uh, choice. That meant you needed to know what was going on that leads to the notion of informed consent and uh, uh, recruiting patients and subjects into studies with as much of an understanding and a free uh, willingness to participate as possible. A second uh, point that came up as important to underline was the uh, need to make sure that um, the risks and benefits of being involved in the research were adequately balanced. And that's particularly uh, important in controlled trials where you are wanting a uh, control group that's not going to get the intervention that you hope will be therapeutically effective. So particularly placebo controlled trials, uh, the question of the risks of those in the placebo group become important. And it, the principle that was established was the one that Dr. Krause suggested to us was that when you are in what they call uh, clinical equipoise, genuine clinical uncertainty about whether the new intervention is better than nothing, uh, then that's the situation in which it's appropriate to let people volunteer for the nothing uh, as well as the, uh, the hopeful something. And then finally, 
the, and maybe most interesting for our conversation today was the third basic idea that came out of those discussions, and that was that we need to watch out in selecting our subjects, our, uh, the, the pools of people that we're going to invite to be volunteers, uh, so we, that we don't exploit particularly socially vulnerable groups, like retarded children in an institution or poor, uneducated, uh, rural uh, uh, folk in the South. Fairness in subject selection and concern over vulnerable populations became a, a theme, and those three basic points have been woven into our federal regulations that govern clinical research and our process now quite elaborate of reviewing each protocol that comes along through the IRBs and developing the consent forms. Well, um, we're at the stage today of taking this whole conversation abroad internationally and thinking about the same issues in this international context. Uh, what does it mean to volunteer for research in cultures that are not as individualistic as we are. Uh, we assume that the informed consent process was a dialogue between a research team and an individual potential volunteer, and that people should make up their own minds. Well, you know, Patty's experience in, uh, in Africa and other people's experience show that in other places, people make up their minds collectively. <laughs> Uh, between the husband, the wife, and the mother-in-law, <laughs> or uh, other kinds of, uh, of, of group considerations. How do we interpret our rules in those settings? Secondly, what is it, how do we know, what does it mean to be an equipoise when you're working in a country that just doesn't have the interventions to provide? Um, where the standard of care is nothing, uh, is that a, an appropriate place to do a placebo-controlled trial where part of the group will get the standard of care, nothing in that context, even when we could, as researchers, bring in the standard treatment to compare to the experimental one. And then finally, this issue of fair subject selection uh, Jim uh, kind of raised it at its most global level. Where should we go to study health problems of concern mainly to us? Is it fair to go to Africa and Asia and the uh, uh, other parts of the world where this is not such a problem to um, do our research? And if we're going around the world, should we the reverse side of that, focus on questions like malaria that are of concern to the people we are inviting to be volunteers. So there's at that level of setting the research priorities, fair subject selection becomes an issue, and then at the uh, more uh, on the ground level, the sense at which we have to continue to worry about exploiting groups that are vulnerable in various ways, uh, whether it's because they live in a, a, a more hierarchical uh, culture and it's not going to be as easy for them to volunteer against our individualistic standards or because they are simply desperate for the kinds of uh, side benefits that come along with being part of a research study, i.e. basic clinical care of various kinds and attention from their local authorities who are happy to have these uh, wealthy Westerners in their, in their site. Bioethics these days, in the, in the 70s when it got started in the wake of uh, this concern about research ethics was focused uh, on the conversation between the researcher and individual subjects. These days, bioethics has followed the research community abroad and is now shifting its uh, attention a good bit towards the international versions of these questions. 
So in our department of bioethics here in the medical school, a lot of our work uh, today is international. Uh, we seem to be jetting off uh, everywhere uh, in different directions. One of our colleagues spent part of the summer in Argentina. Stuart Youngner, our chair, just got back from Taiwan. Patty's always jetting off to Africa. It's become a very different uh, life for people in medical ethics. And another token of this direction is the Inamori Center for International Ethics that Dr. Eastwood is uh, running here at Case these days as well. So that's a, um, I wanted to mention that because I didn't think it had come up yet, but those are both signs, the increasing uh, interest in, and seriousness with which these dis uh, issues are being taken. Patty, uh, do you have any examples from your experience of uh, ethical issues or an ethical issue you faced uh, in the field somewhere uh, and how it was addressed? Yes, I do. And also, um, I want to I want to uh, tell you about an ethical dilemma that came up in the <clears throat> implementation of the HapMap project for the uh, for uh, for the Yoruba population, and also um, um, I wanted to after that I I actually anticipated uh, some discussion about the recent controversies over the use of placebos in um, in international clinical trials. Um, as many of you know, there was a co uh, really a coalescing of energy um, uh, around um, research ethics and the implementation of scientific investigations in, um, in resource-poor settings where people might be vulnerable. And this was in part because of allegations of abuse um, in relation to the tr the HI maternal uh, fetal transmission of HIV, um, and these trials were done in a number of different countries. But the uh, the one that seemed to be of particular that really got a lot of attention was the uh, the trial in um, Uganda, and um, how sink there is still considerable debate about standard of care and the use of, um, of placebos. Um, there, so you have people on two different sides of, of the, uh, who take really uh, opposing views about this. Helsinki was revised in 2000. The CELMS guidelines was revised in 2002, the Nuffield Foundation came out with a wonderful um, report for conducting ethical research in the, in the developing world in 2002. So there's a lot of um, a lot of international focus on these issues now. Um, the Helsinki revised; they have a, a, a clarification of paragraph 29. Um, in 2004, and it concerns just this issue. Um, I happen to have it with me, if, if you would be interested. Or should I just tell my? Well, I can tell you exactly what the Helsinki says right now in the clarification of paragraph 29. They reaffirm their position that extreme care has to be taken in making use of a placebo-controlled trial in that, in general, this methodology should only be used in the absence of existing proven therapy. However, a placebo-controlled trial may be ethically acceptable, even if proven therapy is available under these circumstances. First, where for compelling and scientifically sound methodological reasons its use is necessary to determine the efficacy or safety of the therapeutic method. And second, where a prophylactic diagnostic or therapeutic method is being, in, being investigated for a minor condition, 
And the patients who get the placebo are really not going to be at any additional risk. So those are the two conditions that um, Helsinki has, has outlined. Um, I just thought, I wanted to make yeah, that comment um, just because it's so important, I think, in the world of international research ethics right now. Okay, now I want to tell you a story. Here is what happened when we spoke with the, uh, the, um, the chief of the local tribal council in um, this community of Baba Alamu in the city of Ibadan about the HapMap project. There were several of us who were there. Charles Rotimi, Dr. Charles Rotimi, who was the PI for the investigative, for our investigative team. Um, Dr. Charmaine Royal, who uh, at that time was also at Howard University. We had an NIH, our program officer was with us from um, NHGRI, from the Genome Institute. So there were four of us, um, the invest three from the investigative team and our program officer from NIH. And we're meeting with the chief and members of the tribal council. And there's a very formal introduction that takes place at the chief's house. And then, here's what happens. The one of the members of the council stands up and he reads to us a letter. And we have, can you hear me or not? Yeah. Can you, hear, okay. He, he reads a letter in which he thanks us profusely for the opportunity to participate in this extraordinary adventure, scientific adventure. I'm paraphrasing here, those are my words. He says, we are honored, we are honored to be selected to represent Africa. He said, we would like some acknowledgement from you about the importance of our participation. We would like to build a hospital. Okay, Any, anyone who has an NIH grant knows that there's not a budget line that says funding to build a hospital. <laughs> and um, some, I think you know Jean McEwen, don't you? Okay, Jean was the person who was with us um, from NIH. And poor Jean, as a representative of NIH, says very correctly, I will take this back, which she did. I will take this back to my, you know, to NIH and we'll discuss it. Now, this raises so many issues. Their request for a community benefit that was not in the budget line. However, all NIH required that all HapMap projects that were funded by NIH, we all needed to have some form of community engagement, some form of community consultation, and there were funds that were available for the community. Not enough to build a hospital, certainly. When when um, the man from the council made his, um, uh, read his letter, then I sat back and I thought, okay, we're in a Nigerian market. He's going to start high, we're going to start low, and we're going to meet someplace in the middle. This process of negotiating what would be appropriate for a community benefit took place over um, a long period of time and involved people at NIH, it involved the investigators, it involved people from the community, and it was resolved. But it was a complicated process, um, and it calls attention to, I think, how, um, uh, to questions like, as investigators, 
what are our obligations to provide community benefit to the people who are participating in our studies? What does this mean um, for NIH? I'm th it, it could be any funding institution, but is it NIH's responsibility to provide an enormous level of support um, for communities involved in, in the research they fund? Um, and what about, in this case, what about the issue of community benefits for the other populations who are involved in the HapMap? We live in a global world. We live in a world where people communicate on email, people know each other, um, people have cell phones. Why should Nigeria, why should the Yoruba population get more than the population who are donating samples for the hat map in Kenya, the Luya. You see what I mean? So it was very thorny, very problematic. Will you share what the final conclusion was? About <laughs> yeah. They did not get a hospital, but funds were provided for time, space, services, related to um, capacity building within the community um, so that it, it wasn't, uh, it wasn't an, uh, an unrestricted amount. It wasn't an amount of funds that, that uh, was uh, with no qualifications or conditions um, on it. And so what did they do with that money? There, the money is in a trust right now, and, um, and you know, and this again raises all kinds of issues because for me, the issue of how power is negotiated, um, I mean, who is going to be represented in decisions that are made on exactly how to use those funds? And so there are several people who are representing the community who are involved in in, um, in overseeing that trust. But Eric, it's, do you have But any, you do uh, understand, I want to make clear, you do understand that it's, it was funds that were set, as, that were given to the community for, uh, for use in relation to resources, time, services, space, and so on. It's a related issue, but it's a much bigger issue. So that when you provide an incentive for participation, then you're you're giving um, you, you're giving money or gifts or in other contexts perhaps transportation or food or um, some kind of compensation some kind of incentive for participating in the study, perhaps for an interview, for donating blood, a physical exam, and so on. But here we're talking about uh, at the, a different level, at the level of community. Of course, everyone is aware that in the United States it's common to compensate research subjects for the things Patty mentioned, but the amount of compensation is what is debated. and. You know, how much of an incentive uh, is there to make money on this? And where this is currently controversial is in uh, stem cell research, as you may know, that women who contribute eggs and go through about a two-month, very uncomfortable process, who contribute eggs uh, for uh, stem cell research uh, are not compensated in the United States. Uh, but. Um, but uh, they may be compensated if they, those contributions are for clinical purposes. I don't want to get into that because that's a, <laughs> that isn't a, uh, but, but it, where it is relevant globally, uh, you know, I was at a conference in Boston just a few days ago on stem cell research and someone asked a question, well, could um, a uh, benevolent philanthropist buy the uh, eggs from someone from overseas and donate them to research in the United States. And 
the answer to that uh, is uh, that is unethical, and I think that's within the guidelines of uh, one of our colleagues in the Department of Bioethics. Um, uh, uh, Insu. Uh, Insu. Yeah, Insu uh, uh, Hyun, uh, who has uh, helped devise uh, international guidelines. And the reason there is that that is a perfect setup for uh, selling an organ, basically, um, the organ being uh, eggs. Uh, what's interesting to me about Patty's story is that it's not exactly the issue of undue inducement. You know, we, they didn't, the NIH didn't go in there and say, hey, if you participate in the HapMap project, we'll build you a hospital, right. and which you know, would put an uncomfortable pressure on the community, which needs that resource. Instead, it so kind of sounds like NIH got held up by some savvy uh, research participants who had basically already agreed to participate and then said, now quid pro quo. Thank you. That's a very important point. They had already said that they would participate. Um, and so this, this came from them after they agreed uh, to participate. I wonder if we ought to, uh, I know that time is going, and uh, Eric probably has a good example, but we haven't given you sure. the opportunity yet. And I, uh, Ed, why not? Uh, I wonder if you could comment on the intersection of commercialization with NIH-type research. And at what point and how and who does this, at what point and how and who determines it? It must be very difficult from an ethical standpoint, from a financial standpoint, from who is paying for what and who is getting what for what we're paying for. Sure. Um, well, it is in, uh, increasingly complicated um, uh, for a number of reasons. Uh, one big one being that since the Bayh-Dole Act was passed, it's been our official public policy in the U.S. to transfer technology as quickly as possible from federally funded research into commercial um, production. So the, here at, at the university, all of us get uh, periodic emails from our technology transfer officer saying, invented anything lately? <laughs> Discovered anything lately? Let me know about it so I can get those patent applications going for you. Um, so that's the the climate for research in general and of course then people do patent it and then they think about spinning off companies from their research and that's become a part of life for basic science in a way I think it never was before um, and it raises these questions of conflict of interest when you get into the field actually doing the the studies uh, so there's a lot of attention being paid to that today is that the kind of commercialization problem you were thinking about, or? Exactly, but it seems that there has to be some degree of resolution, and there's some guide. I would expect there's some guidelines in place. Yes. And I suggest, it's, uh, you're suggesting that there are not enough, or that they're not clear, is that correct? Well, I think there are guidelines in place to control these uh, issues of, of conflict of interest and the university has a pretty clear set. Um, it's just that, uh, you know, issues do still come up. Uh, people don't always follow the guidelines. In, in as much as um, investigators, say, in Nigeria, have faculty appointments at one or another university, I would say virtually every university has rules regarding <laughs> patents and what, uh, you know, what's, his, what's the sharing agreement between the university and the individual, or sometimes the department gets in there too. And so Case Western Reserve University has those rules. Um, I would say the rules cover about 98% of the situations. <laughs> There's always something that isn't covered by the rules. And I suppose in as much as people are involved in these teams that may not be under some sort of an institution, I don't know how much that uh, I mean, they're either in the government or under some academic institution, I would assume. What do you, what's, are there independent uh, contractors? Well, there, there certainly are pharmaceutical companies right. that do right. research abroad, right. Right. Um, as in your reluctant yes. partner <laughs> right. film. 
not just pharmaceutical companies, but you know, one of my associations to your question was the um, the issue of uh, bi biopiracy, or you know, people uh, uh, the accusation that some populations are being exploited because they don't understand what they're participating in, and um, and uh, tissues or DNA samples or uh, pro uh, products, plant products um, are taken out of, from them or out uh, or from their community and then used to, um, in, in the, uh, used to develop um, uh, perhaps a pharmaceutical drug or perhaps a, a, some kind of medical intervention. And though those kinds of accusations, are, are, I, I think, um, and not just accusations, but those kinds of um, situations w will probably continue to come up, m maybe even more in the future, because of um, scientific and technological advances. I don't know. Could someone think of a uh, of a, a good example of that? Yeah, I Jim. Some rare plants in some parts of Papua New Guinea. Perfect not example. They're classified. Yes. But they're, they're working with the museum in London, the Museum of Natural History, and so they have specimens. You know, the Great Victorian Era, where you collect samples. Okay. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. they have these well-preserved leaves and things like that, where you can actually these these plants may not even exist in some parts of that of the world anymore. Yes. But you can actually then get the DNA from these things, and you know, or, or you can extract phenolic lipids and things like that. So. Right. Um, on the other side of that, though, is that as long as people, a, going back to your example, is that that where were the Niger, where were the Nigerian representatives? I mean, that that was kind of like almost like a setup. I mean, you know, it was yeah. a, I mean, one for, one thing for me working in a developing country for many years, it's critical that you have good trust relationships with people in developing countries. The scientists, the public health officials. And just like here, there's a spectrum of people who are more in touch with these kind of issues and some people who are perhaps honestly to be devious in some, because they're, they're in it for their own personal fame, to put it kind of really kind of at the, lowest, at the lowest level. But I think that one of the things that I've really found that I've confronted over the last several years is the differences in perspectives is the lack of cultural sensitivity on this end. I don't know about yeah, our I IRB, agree. but our NIH actually is the best example of that, I think, is they're really out of touch. So I was at a hospital in Kenya where it's funded by the Wellcome Trust. It's a phenomenal facility. And they have, they're doing studies on acute infectious causes of death under three-year-old and kids, okay? And I saw these kids there, I went, they have an intensive care unit. There wasn't a single respirator there. And mm -hmm. the reason there's no respirator is because in rural hospitals in Kenya, there are no mm -hmm. respirators. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's just like, how do you, you don't study chronic renal failure in Africa because right. people die of it. There's no exactly. dialysis. Exactly. So they made the decision, and this, this can change over time, but I think you have to do research that's culturally appropriate. And, we, and something that you touched on, Patty, I don't think we should sell people short in developing countries. They're as, sophist as sophisticated I agree. in many ways and in more ways, yes. and they're much less litigious than we are as well. Exactly, okay. so I agree. There's so there um, there's so many issues that you raised. First of all, just parenthetically, in relation to Hap, the HapMap project with Yoruba, um, this was a community uh, where I, actually I've been working in that community for a number of years. But in addition, apart from my uh, social science ethics work, um, our collaborator in um, Nigeria, in this area, uh, Clement Adebomowo, he has a very strong relationship with that community and has actively helped um, expand healthcare resources. Um, so it was a uh, it was a situation of trust. And actually, I think that it's really important that we um, that we do what we can to. Uh, to develop innovative ways to build local capacity to get those respirators into the hospital. I mean, I, 
um, and and I think that it's that as researchers we we can't we don't we can't do it ourselves. A funding institution can't do it ourselves. Can't do it themselves. I think that there really does need to be um, uh, a, a joined partnership between um, public and private. Uh, institutions and agencies at the international level and I think that people from different uh, backgrounds um, it, different professional backgrounds and communities different communities need to be represented it's it won't happen otherwise NIH yeah, there's, can't there's do this a number we of questions can't do out it. here I think uh, young lady right here yeah, um, and then abroad but um, have been I've been involved with clinical vaccine trials in infants mm. and still still am somewhat. Um, what, you're, what you're going through now is what we went, um, went through sort of 50 years ago in some ways. Uh, I was alive and working with Dr. Robbins here in 1954 during the salt vaccine field trials. And um, that you could not, in this country today, 50 years later, probably could not do that trial. What, why could that trial be done? Um, because of the, public, the, the nature of the disease, the problem. I mean, we're getting crippled children. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Okay. I think we would not have, a uh, certain number of things kind of came together, and I, I, I've thought about this many, many times later. Certain things, there was a confluence. We had a president who had polio. He died from swimming in the Hudson River. I live up pretty close to where. That's what he said. He had polio. Uh, he had uh, the, the disease, everybody knew the disease. And That's a good there point. was fear. Everybody was afraid. All of a sudden, there was something that could help. It was not clear that we didn't understand all of it. We, we understood a fair bit of the biology, but we didn't understand all of it. So that there was a rather profound educational program that was actually supported by the March of Dimes. This was before NIH. And this was uh, FDR's partners, who, and um, they developed uh, the National Foundation. Uh, and they had all of the mothers collecting dimes. There was all of this going along. And then there was this opportunity to prevent, try to prevent so that there, it had a background of education. Mm -hmm. And it, the, the process, though, was still um, to an individual. An individual parent had to consent. There was, there was a placebo. There was a, a group that never got anything. There was a no young man and they had control. There wasn't the, um, there was not coercion. It was still voluntary, but the, the thing was, there was something potentially good that could come out of it to prevent, you know, the crippling disease. And I think if we had that, and I've had that experience, that that went and it worked, and I think it's all. But there was a tremendous amount of, of public education, publicity. Um, and you didn't have, nobody was really concerned about what could happen if it went wrong until, you know, afterwards. There was the cover incident which, mm -hmm. where the, there was live virus right. produced commercial. So uh, I guess my point is that um, in that kind of a milieu, if the, are they worried about, in Uganda, were they, are they worried about their babies getting, um, getting um, AIDS? Were they able? To, they were able to set, set up uh, trials using nevirapine for to the pregnant women. I think the original trials, not everybody got nevirapine, or at least they had different. 
No, they didn't. That is a good example of the kinds of issues that are still being faced around the world. And it's much harder. Um, I've, I've never been involved with, the only thing we've ever given is, is um, offered a uh, bus fare or something right. for mm -hmm. transportation, which is not unreasonable. Mm -mm. There's another question back there. Yeah. Did you yeah. have a question? Yeah. Oh, there are a couple more questions. How true is the constant gardener for the people that yeah. work overseas? <laughs> Jim. When I, I remember when that book came out. I think it was a fantastic book. Yeah. Um, but President Moy would not, he, he could not buy that book in Kenya. You couldn't buy a constant gardener in Kenya because the government officials were, I potentially be identified as some of the, the fictitious individuals who were part of the whole conspiracy. Can, can I just back up? Uh, I'm, I'm, uh, we're assuming everyone knows what oh, the well, constant gardener, gardener is. Yeah, this is a situation where there is a uh, uh, tr trial of a drug uh, in uh, Africa, I believe, to treat uh, multiple drug-resistant TB. It doesn't make a difference, but I think that's what it was. And there was an active suppression of serious side effects, some of which actually killed young women, uh, at least in this book. So the allegation in this book is that Big Pharma does this, manipulates the data actively <laughs> to make a, a profit. So, Jim, and, and, and the, and the, and the um, government, the British Embassy, and their relationships within the Kenyan, because it took place in Kenya. Yeah. Um, um, they, of course, they were somehow involved. There's a lot more to the book, but that's, so it, it made the governments it look like they were in collusion with Big Pharma. Right. Yeah. And it's obviously a conceivable thing. I mean, and, but, um, but. So a question, uh, is there any truth to this from people in the field? Go ahead. Or are we restrained? I don't do that kind of, I, 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 I haven't seen it more. Uh, I haven't seen drugs being tested in my limited experience in Africa, Papua New Guinea, um, or uh, that would be for, so that it, so that they could a, a be marketed in more lucrative markets, okay, like in the United States or in Western Europe. Um, so I, I haven't personally experienced that. I have, I have no knowledge of that. There, um, I. I have not personally experienced it either, but there have been cases that have come up. I'm thinking of Pfizer. Is anyone here familiar with the Pfizer case? Um, a few years ago, Washington Post had a, uh, had a series actually addressing um, uh, international medical research, and that was uh, they call, they brought to light. Um, the, the this Pfizer situation. Pfizer had gone in during an epidemic, uh, um, meningitis epidemic, that was happening in um, the Kano region of Nigeria. This is in northern Nigeria, and uh, physicians without borders already had a, a setup there, and they were taking care of the people. Um, I, providing treatment for for them and F Pfizer had a drug that they wanted to test what is the name of the drug I want to say Tanaf not Tanaf is was it uh, Tanafavir does that sound right or am I doing a transposition doesn't matter it, okay um, anyway they <clears throat> there were allegations and th there was a suit uh, actually uh, th th this went to court um, the allegation was that the Pfizer wanted to test this drug that they were developing uh, to treat meningitis. They, um, they claimed that they had permission from the government. Um, this would have been probably permission from the Ministry of Health. At that time, there was not uh, a, a national ethics 
uh, at the national level, there wasn't a government um, uh, committee to, to look at, uh, at research, so it probably came from the Ministry of Health. And uh, they said that they got informed consent, but um, a few children died. And I, do, I can't remember the, the number, but it was pretty serious. And they said the people who participated in that study said that they were not given consent. They didn't know what they were consenting to. Um, and so that's a, uh, an example. Um, I, I wish that I had all the facts in front of me. Yeah. <laughs> I was just reading. I, I think this is, I read something about this several weeks ago. I don't know if it's the same thing. It's there was a, there was a, there were outbreaks of meningococcal meningitis periodically in sub-Saharan Africa. Yes. And a, and a, I can't remember the company. It was, but, but, something okay, did, it was, it was, it was a, Pfizer. It was a vaccine, okay, oh, it was a vaccine. Different. And there were, and, and from what I, this is the New York Times I'm reading, okay? So uh -huh. Put the Times against the Post. Who knows what the exact facts are? <laughs> but now the families of kids who participated in this trial—these were kids who were admitted to the hospital with a diagnosis of bacterial meningitis. That's it. It's okay. the same thing. Some, it's the same. There's long-term side effects because they had meningitis, like they're deaf in one ear. These things you see in untreated bacterial meningitis. So at least my reading of it was is that it was a legitimate uh, thing that that they were testing. It was a new vaccine, and it covers the serotypes which were there, it was broader than the standard meningococcal vaccine. And now 10 to 15 years later, some of the families it's of the same kids thing. who've had permanent disabilities because they had meningitis, which they needed to be treated for, which is, okay, so, so that's an example where I, I mean, at least my understanding was, is that I would not, held, I would not hold them liable for that. You know what I mean? I, I, I didn't see where there was a, an error of judgment or lack of informed consent. These were really sick kids, or it was right in the middle of a, a meningitis epidemic. That, that's my recollection of Maybe it. Maybe I should ask the questioner. Have you had experience like this? Is that why? Okay. Oh, there's another question then. No. If I may change the subject a bit, I wanted to ask a question in regard to question three or the comment that you have here about business being conducted differently in different countries and so on about the payoffs. Is there any official policy if you're working with NIH or some of the uh, known organizations like that? In which, how do they deal with this? What's been your experience in this? In other words, are you allowed to, does the NIH condone uh, bribing and Pay other kind of payoffs, things like that? Yeah, bribery no. is another line on the yeah, budget. Right. You can. <laughs> <laughs> No. Well, <laughs> there were times when uh, well, there were times when uh, projects, particularly USAID projects, uh, under personnel, there was everybody from the principal investigator uh, to the dean of the medical school spent a little time on the project to the Minister of Health who spent a little time on the project, 3% or something like that. Uh, it was there, it was not, it was not bribery in the no. sense it was underhanded. Right. But it's also no. true that the Dean of the Medical School, the Minister of Health, it's hard to say that they participated <laughs> in the project itself. Let's say they gave their assent. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's a good way to put it. Yeah, is there yeah, a comment? That's a good yeah. way to put yeah. it. Well, from an ethical perspective, you could say that the um, African hospital was a bribe. When they came up and said, we'll do this, mm -hmm. you give us, it's quid pro quo, isn't that what a bribe is? Well, you're getting into whole foreign aid policy in the United States, too. <laughs> yeah. And, the, and the, remember the hospital, <laughs> they didn't get the, the a, a hospital. But There's a question over here. Well, couldn't you provide us with a computer? Well, I didn't have a computer in the budget, and I thought of, th tried a bit on seeing where I might get it from philanthropy. But then, uh, this is in rural school. They had these slates I showed you. But what I did do out of my own pocket is I bought uh, a, uh, a four by six uh, whiteboard and a whole handful, a whole basket full of yellow.
yellow of, of colored uh, marking pencils and a half a dozen erasers. So we took those out. I think the whole thing cost me 50 bucks. So I took them out to that school. So for the first time, they actually had a blackboard that the teacher could yeah. write on. So it wasn't a, a computer, whiteboard. but it was something. <laughs> yeah. One last question up here. The issue of informed consent has come up in different ways. I was interested in Dick Crowsey's uh, early comment there about the, the not notary public need. Do we need notary publics for all of these uh, informed consent? But uh, I think that uh, my basic question, do you find that there are differing national definitions of informed consent? Well, I think uh, there are, certainly, and certainly the biggest ones are cultural, East, West, uh, <coughs> Asia, and so on. But uh, those of you who have had a direct experience may want to answer. Here in the U.S., the uh, federal regs require informed consent. There are specific conditions when you need, that are outlined when you need written consent. Um, informed consent is universally agreed upon. Um, by virtue, the, the notion of informed consent and voluntary participation, that's something that virtually all people everywhere say it's a good thing. Um, what, how that is articulated in the field um, uh, becomes more problematic, um, particularly when you're working with uh, individuals where um, where there, there is a strong feeling that you need to have consent or approval, approval from a male head of household, or if you're working with an extended uh, family compound, um, it's problematic when, when you ask the question, are you really getting truly informed consent if someone can't understand um, um, you know, you, you, ha you showed a two-page consent document, but the hat map consent form was quite longer, quite longer. And, uh, and then, of course, when things are translated, um, things might be lost in translation if there are no equivalent expressions for words. Um, language is, is not just about the communication of a word, it's also the communication of, uh, of a cultural um, background, a cultural way of talking about life, about things. Um, so I think that there are different, different ways that, that the notion of consent is applied, absolutely. But the, the rules, if you look around the world, are strikingly similar and modeled on ours. And that's not an accident because the, our regulations ask U.S. investigators to play by our rules wherever they are. So there needs to be some kind of system that's relatively equivalent in these different countries. Sometimes when, when you're, you know, sometimes, sometimes people will say to you, why are you asking me to sign right. this paper or put my thumbprint when I've already told you that I'm willing to talk to you. And um, there, are, there are significant issues that come up. For example, what does it mean to put your signature on a piece of paper that you maybe cannot read, or your, th your thumbprint, when perhaps in, in your area there has, uh, there's uh, some type of history of political discrimination or ethnic discrimination, people um, may have uh, been hurt in some way, lost property. You know, let me give you an example. Think about Nigeria. Nigeria, until, uh, not, well, it's only been a democracy f uh, in the last few years. When was, um, when w did Abache, it was a dictatorship until when? N 19, the late 90s? I mean, when did they have their, Democratic election for the first time. I believe it was 98 or 99. Not exactly mm -hmm. sure about that. But in any case, here's the thing. People disappeared. Um, 
in the 80s. People, it was not necessarily a safe place to be. In 1998, the first time that I was in Nigeria, um, I was going back to the airport and two policemen with submachine guns were in the van and I was the only passenger. And I thought it was a situation where that happens sometimes, you know, where you're driving along the road and people get picked up and then you go two miles and then they get off because it's closer to their home or their place of work. And I said to one of the uh, policemen, I said, oh, are, are you going to the airport too? And he said, well, we are here to protect you. And the next time, in the next year, in 1999, I had one, one policeman with a submachine gun. I thought, ah, democracy is, is working yeah. here. But you know, let me tell you. It's just an orange at the, level of security. <laughs> orange. But here's what happened. For the HapMap project, we did a um, wonderful focus group with some, um, with a diverse group of community members. And one of the gentlemen, who participated in the focus group. You know, in the beginning, we got written, informed consent from everyone. This was an audio tape focus group. And he was walking in and making a joke. He, he got there a little bit late, and he was making a joke about the consent form for the focus group. He lifts it up in the air, and he said, ah, he said, you want me to sign this. I better read it carefully, because you never know I could die. This is on tape. And he was making a joke. But you know, think about that. What, you don't just say that. You just don't, you just, it was an offhand comment. But it was a joke he because was a, of a, a background. It, it was a joke sense. that was historically, yeah. Um, so the point that I want to make there is that, you know, signing, putting your signature on a piece of paper. Um, has a symbolic load. We take it for granted here in the US. But even here, what is the percentage? Anyone know what the percentage is of people who are illiterate? In our po sample population a few years ago in metropolitan Chicago, um, more than 300 people were recruited in our study. 5% could not read. And this was looking at informed consent to genetic epidemiological research on hypertension. 5% in metropolitan Chicago. I think we better get you to lunch. We I'm really sorry. appreciate <laughs> your questions and your attentiveness, and I want to thank uh, our, my fellow panelists, too. Thank you. Thank you.